Well, hello there, everyone. Welcome to our program on behalf of Abbott. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to attend this event. Life is about timing, identifying advancing heart failure in patients with the CardioMEMS HF system. I want to go over a couple of things about our platform here today. One, you're going to see bottom of your screen several widgets that you can customize and use to interact with us here today. I do suggest also that you close down any other web browsers you might have open, especially if they have an audio or video tied to them. If you are on the Chrome browser, you're on the right browser. That is our preferred one for this platform. If you have any technical issues, you can use that help widget bottom of the screen. Uh, I'll also let you know a quick F5 or a refresh on the PC most likely get you right back in the program if there's any glitch or hiccup there, and that'll get you right back into the content that we'll be sharing here today. Do want to let you know a little bit about what we're going to be covering here. We've got a, an expert panel, five doctors on board. They'll be speaking today. They're going to be looking at some of the key factors in assessing advancing heart failure. We're going to talk about some treatment options for uh, non-responders and then the role of LVAT therapy as the patient does advance from class 3 to class 3B as well as class 4 heart Failure. So those are some of the topics that we're going to be covering. I want to go over a couple of disclaimers for everyone to be aware of. The content in this call does represent the beliefs of the speakers, not necessarily the views of Abbott. Information presented is consistent with applicable FDA guidelines. The speakers are presenting at the request and on behalf of Abbott, and an honoraria is being provided. This meeting not intended for those continuing education unit credits, and the support of this program has been provided by, again, Abbott. We're glad to have that. Support. We also have the support. Again, I mentioned three doctors. Here are special guest speakers for the event. Dr. Ashwin Ravachandran, he is the medical director of mechanical circulatory support at St. Vincent's Medical Group in Indianapolis, Indiana. Dr. Patrick McCann on board, medical director of the heart failure and mechanical circulatory support at Prisma Health in Columbia, South Carolina. And Dr. Jerry Estep, he is the section head of heart failure and transplantation at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Cleveland, Ohio. And we've got two dual content moderators with us here today as well. My pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Cormos, the Divisional Vice President of Medical Affairs for Heart Failure for Abbott, and also Dr. Phil Adamson, the Divisional Vice President of Medical Affairs and Chief Medical Officer for Heart Failure, and he's the gentleman that I'm going to turn things over to for the remainder of the content here today. Again, feel free to get your questions and comments into this esteemed panel. And with that, Dr. Adamson, I'm going to turn things over to you. As usual, thank you, James, and thank you very much for joining us today. I'm very excited about the opportunities to discuss with this very distinguished panel uh, some issues that I think are really important as we look at hemodynamic monitoring of patients using the CardioMEM system. In particular, you know, we've focused over the years at, at uh, utilizing CardioMEMS for volume management, essentially, and in, in, in preventing congestion, leading to a hospitalization. Repeated clinical trials demonstrate the, the utility and the superiority of that approach over normal clinical practice. What I, what I think we've discovered and what we'll discuss today are new things to think about, and that is that you know we also get lots of hemodynamic information about the pathophysiology our patients have in, in their heart failure syndromes. And as we move into understanding that pathophysiology, its implications and maybe prognostic value, I think we have a lot of decisions that we can make over time based on the information that we get from the device and from this experience of looking at patients in what I call the lesion of the disease, and that's cardiac filling pressures. I'm very pleased to, to be here as a co-moderator with my colleague, uh, Bob Cuormos, a cardiothoracic surgeon formerly at the in University of Pittsburgh, and, and I, I'm, I'm very, very happy to welcome everyone as well as our, our esteemed guests. I'm not gonna go any more talking. I want to hear from Ashwin Ravachandran, who's gonna actually present our, our, our system today uh, with a case study, and we can use that to, to move forward with our discussion. Ashwin? Thanks, Phil, and uh, appreciate Abbott and everybody else for organizing this and inviting me to come join the discussion. It'll be fun. So as we move forward here, um, this is actually a case from a few years ago. It's actually a uh, sort of middle-aged woman who we met in cardiogenic shock in May of 17, um, smoker, and uh, continues to smoke actually to this day and therefore not transplantable. When we met her, she actually had multivessel disease that uh, 
caused her cardiogenic shock presentation and she was not actually deemed a cabbage candidate due to the severity of her LV dysfunction. She was on uh, intra-aortic balloon pump support. We were actually able to get her on some guideline-directed medical therapy and eventually get her a CRT uh, device before she was eventually discharged successfully. Um, fast forward a couple of years later to early 19, she actually had a shock um, from VF and she was admitted to the hospital for that, loaded with amio, was a little bit volume up, so we diureased her gently, um, could not really titrate her guideline-directed medical therapy much due to hypotension, and was sort of starting to um, meet all of the, the criteria you see there on the right there with uh, this recent Jack review article from a couple of years ago, looking at kind of what happens to all of the organs in people with acute shock or acute MI. So we got the device placed, the cardiomyopathy device placed pretty easily, um, and she ended up having pressures that looked a lot like this for the majority of the first part of 2019. She was around 40 over 20, you could see there, um, with still class three symptomatology, no admissions to the hospital. And then sort of fast forward to later in the year, and we are a little bit worried now. Her pressures are starting to go up into the 60s range over 40s. And this is actually a snapshot from August of that year. And she ends up coming into the hospital with all sorts of noise and finally getting an LVAD implantation at which time you could see things sort of smoothed out. And so kind of our uh, approach to this patient was we kind of knew the writing was on the wall. We sort of felt like she was gonna move towards advanced therapies, but is there a way we can monitor her and try to keep that from happening at least for a little while and kick the can down the road, so to speak, before she ends up going on to, to needing a VAT? So I will stop there and turn it back. Well, thank you. Thank you, Austin. This is a fascinating case. And, I, you know, one of the things that was really fascinating to me when I looked at your slides is the is the variability in, in the in the PA pressures um, when you first put the device in. You know, so we have the concept that the pressures are high, but also this this concept that the pressures are variable. Can you comment about that? Yeah, and that's exactly right. And that's that's kind of what worried us actually initially when we put in the device. We tried to do the usual things with volume management, as you mentioned, that being sort of one of the lesions of the disease, as you put it so elegantly. But then, um, you know, again, we're limited by up titration of guideline directed medical therapy, which is often what you try to do in sort of your routine class three patient. But in sort of the patient that's advanced with their heart failure, you kind of see that undulation in their waveforms. And that really does worry you that you need to start having that conversation if you haven't already. Yeah. Patrick, have you seen that kind of variability before in, in your patients versus a very quiescent sort of non-variable signal? Yep, that's uh, certainly a, a marker that uh, concerns us. Um, more so generally what we see is the, the trend in the rise in PA pressures despite uh, escalating diuretic therapy. Um, oftentimes we'll see it you know, uh, as was mentioned in the setting of hypotension. And so you're limited on GDMT optimization, but despite increasing diuretics, you know, whether that's doubling doses or adding thiazides, those PA pressures tend to stay elevated. Um, and soon after, generally what you'll start to see is uh, what we notice first, at least, is a little bit of decline in renal function, uh, likely owing to cardiorenal syndrome there. And so that trend, you know, now that we've seen it enough, uh, is certainly a marker where we think it, you know, it's time for repeat uh, invasive hemodynamic evaluation, right heart cath, and then possibly on to inotropes and then more advanced support. And Jerry, do you see, I mean, you know, we're, we're talking really about how patients who have a class three previous hospitalization transition sort of as right before our eyes into uh, advanced therapy uh, or at least advanced pathophysiology, let's say that. How, how do you see hemodynamics playing a role? We've, we've heard a couple of, of, of examples. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think the hemodynamic alteration is the sine qua non for disease progression. And, and I think it's the predecessor before worsening symptom burden. You know, we're certainly taught and, 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 and teach um, to understand going from neurocart class three to rest breathlessness or the fatigue equivalent, 
We're certainly taught and teach about lab surveillance, right, for end organ dysfunction or low output syndrome, in addition to high filling pressures as the hemodynamic most worrisome profile. But for me, what's very you know reassuring is having that monitoring it, without that same frequency of symptom burden assessment, um, functional capacity assessment, lab surveillance, assessment, it positions you and is a real red flag that should not be taken lightly, um, that that things are progressing. And that end pulmonary diastolic pressure, you know, while I was very taken back by the, the 20 going up closer to 40, right? Um, uh, 35, 40. And, and for me, that needs to be explained. That degree in alteration um, with the with the with the post MI or the you know the, the overt presentation on the front end. And so no better way to understand trajectory than to be monitoring it in real time on a day-to-day -day basis. And so a fundamental, Bill. And, and I think, you know, Rob, both, both Patrick and, and Ashwin mentioned the, the whole concept of applying guideline directed medical therapy. And I, 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 you know, we all know now, and I'll just make it very clear that guideline directed medical therapy is the drug and the dose. I mean, we've used forced titration studies to demonstrate neurohormonal interventions benefits in patients with at least reduced ejection fraction heart failure how how have you seen either the responsiveness, the lack of responsiveness? Is there a hemodynamic signal, not just systemic pressure signal, but a PA hemodynamic signal that may tip you off that the, the that, that guideline directed medical therapies may not be tolerated or can't be titrated higher? Any anyone see that? Yeah, yeah certainly. I'll go ahead start and, and, and I think the short answer is yes, right? And, you know, I remember, you know, the early 2000s and beta blocker clinic every two weeks looking for acquired edema in terms of uh, progression or intolerability to then beta blockers. But I think when we're using this concoction of, you know, the four pillars of meds and now we're preaching, have them all on board maybe uh, versus staggered and want the ability to, to, to see how a patient's responding by their baseline hemodynamics and changes and, and elevation is is a bad signal. I think it gives us information we never had before in the context of a GTNT optimization and non-response. Ashwin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I would completely agree with that. And, you know, one of the things you'd like to see over time is a kind of decline, as you had mentioned earlier, about alterations or degrees of alteration probably a smoother decline as you're going up on GDMT. And it's really nice to see that if you can sort of um, explain that this is part of the reason why your GDMT is working, it's kind of nice to have that objectivity behind it. You know, one of the things that we keep talking about, and you sort of mentioned earlier, Jerry, when you're talking about functional assessments and the in-person assessments and things like that, you don't need that. And you don't need to worry about the patient calling in to tell you, hey, this is how I'm feeling. I feel great doc, but in fact, they've you know got a PAD of 40. And, or vice versa, right? They feel terrible, but their PAD is, you know, 15 or something. And maybe in that case, you'd be worried more about low output. But those are sort of the things that we absolutely look at for sure. I think one of the other uh, parts here to uh, look at in terms of GDMT and the PA pressures is that it allows you to optimize the GDMT quicker, right? Uh, looking at what the response is going to be instead of waiting for them to come back in one to two weeks. Uh, potentially, you can see what those changes are. Uh, from your uh, adjustment of therapy and, and titration of medications, that allows you to be more aggressive. Certainly, that is uh, one of the ways we utilize the system. It's great for preventing uh, and tracking, but the optimization of therapy sooner uh, and more aggressive, I think, is one of the key benefits. And then that's reflected um, in patients staying at their goal, PAD pressures, or whatever you might be using. And I think one of the... Um, uh, ways we can move forward potentially is to see, you know, at certain levels of GDMT, if those patients are staring, staying under their threshold and, and for how often, for how long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think what we're talking about really is the, we, we've done this now for some time. I mean, I, I think we, we published the first paper back in 20, I don't know, 21 years ago or 26 years ago. I can't now remember I'm getting too old to remember. But what, what, what I mean by that is that we have a, now a, a, a remarkable experience in what it means to actually treat these, treat heart failure patients based on 
remotely acquired hemodynamics. And part and parcel of that is understanding the guideline directed medical therapies, the dosages, the titration schemes. But but what what about what about the concept that you know patients who have other interventions like CRT or like microclip or whatever that 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 touch a component of the pathophysiology have you, have you have you any experience in understanding how how cardiomems can give rise to an under, to, to to sort of the responsiveness of, to those interventions and patrick you're you're up yeah. so what do you so, have any opinion about that absolutely so we actually have a few patients with crt devices uh and you can see you know an excellent response when they keep their thresholds nice and low. Um, and then I think this also allows you uh, some ability to make sure that they're pacing as much as they need to in the CRT device. You know, sometimes depending on uh, other arrhythmias, uh, they may not be uh, or how the device is um, programmed. But uh, but certainly we've seen the response uh, with our CRT responders uh, where we really actually don't need to continue titrating their therapy up maybe to maximally tolerated doses as in clinical trials uh, because of, you know, potential uh, risks of hypotension uh, for those folks, but they stay at a nice low threshold with their CRTD after it's in and pacing well. Uh, and you know that they've responded well to the therapy and they're going to continue to do well in the long term. Uh, when you don't see that response, uh, it allows you obviously to think of other interventions sooner um, rather than waiting, you know, to give a time uh, with their CRT response. Uh, or to, you know, again, try to maximize their optimal uh, medical therapy. Uh, but absolutely, that that response is there for other mechanical devices. Um, and one of the things I'm kind of curious about, and I don't know if anybody else here has um, any experience yet, uh, is with some of the newer um, nerve stimulation and carotid stimulation uh, devices with PA monitoring. I would welcome anybody's uh, experience about that. We're considering uh, that for a few of our patients uh, currently. That's a fascinating question, Patrick, and probably something you'd hope to see the same type of result with, you know. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, if we're har harping on the fact that hemodynamics are really where our money is lying in terms of how the patient's really doing and how they could potentially even remodel for the better, that would certainly be a, another avenue to look at. Yeah, you know, our experience has been very similar, too. And, you know, I'll take it even a, a, a different angle at this. Uh, we have some patients that, you know, unfortunately go on to develop cancer and they'll start getting chemotherapy, they'll get fluid with their chemotherapy, and we can almost reliably tell that they're getting it on Mondays because they get a liter of fluid, and that's when their PA pressures go up, and we say, hey, you know what? We just figured this out over the last few weeks. You may not have even told us, but that's when your triggers go off, and so these are the days we want you to take extra loop diuretics and things like that. So on the flip side, anything that could adversely affect the patient, we can identify as well and maybe stay ahead of that. So following up on Phil's question here, I want to understand a little bit about mechanics. Let Help me understand, and for the audience here today, if you have a patient that gets resynchronization therapy or a mitral clip, how do you decide that, okay, it, and, and we have the indications, but how do you so decide when to, to put that cardiomems in that patient? And then what is that, that thing that tells you they haven't responded? For those of you that have followed these patients. Like, let's start with my... Sorry, Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say it's a great question. And I think, you know, here at the clinic, we certainly work to position the heart failure team to be linked with the structural heart team for mitral valve considerations, whether it's the clip or, or another. And similarly with the chronic resynchronization therapy. So try, you know, having a handle on these patients on the upfront understands those patients at risk. And we know response may not be ideal, right? Uh, as, a, as a super responder for CRT or even with the mitral valve clip. So I think it's important to, to know your patient population. And then um, specifically, what we're expecting is improvement in the syndrome, right, along clinical grounds. But but I think it's important to have that low threshold, you know, leveraging device labeling with New York Heart Class 3 and prior hospitalization. If patients aren't responding despite 
what you've done in keeping with evidence, whether it's medicine or a mitral valve clip or CRT, um, I think the CardioMabs is incredibly, incredibly useful. You know, we've gone to this formalized structure for CRT placements um, at main campus. They're seen in our CRT heart failure optimization clinic where we're positioned at one month and six months the earlier the better to make appropriate medication changes, but to understand that lack of response. And for patients that are persistently symptomatic, despite the standards, it's a ripe person for cardiomems because the, tra the trajectory doesn't look good. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> I mean, is this, um, l let me ask um, Patrick, I mean, do you open up conversations with your EP partners when, when, you see this happen or do you have this line of communication established for example so that there is an easy transition or communication and either ashwin or you could answer this but i'm curious about how that communication pathway gets established and functions sure absolutely i mean i think a big part of it is reaching out and with communication and having uh both parts from ep and heart failure understanding what we're trying to accomplish uh with that we have actually um increase the growth of our remote monitoring to include the ICDs, especially now with a lot of them having heart failure algorithms, um, which are good, but they're not quite um, as timely uh, as the PA pressure, uh, obviously. So uh, to Jerry's point, you know, the CRT optimization, really the majority of that lies within heart failure um, in terms of how we're optimizing the medical therapy and bringing them back in for follow-up. And so the, the PA pressure, honestly, for what you had mentioned previously, uh, as far as the monitor goes, I mean, really, to my, to my thought on it, we should be doing it, you know, before mitrals, because um, the mitral clip, although it's good, you know, we're slowing the progression. We're not stopping it necessarily uh, with that. And if you have a marker in there that can show that, hey, something has changed from the time you had this implanted to six, eight months, 12 months down the road, you can intervene sooner uh, rather than later and, and avoid the, you know, organ dysfunction, uh, which can sometimes easily tip people over into a hospitalization, right? I mean, we've all seen it hundreds of times where a little bump in the creatinine and somebody stops their diuretics and next thing you know, they're in the hospital uh, on a BiPAP. So uh, I think we need to be utilizing the device more frequently because it increases the access to care. And that's across the spectrum, whether or not they have a device, mitral clip or CRT, um, because we're not able to see all of these patients on a daily basis and things change while they're spending 90% of their time away from us. Patrick, I totally agree. And you know, what we've tried to do is um, have a loose sort of uh, CRT clinic, uh, kind of a little bit modeled after what Jerry's doing at, in Cleveland, but um, we basically are across the hall from each other and just try to talk with one another about you know, what's going on with these patients and what can we do to optimize them from either end to either get them to a device or once they've gotten a device, is there anything they can adjust with the pacemaker settings or is there anything we can adjust med-wise? But absolutely spot on. There's two really important points there. One is that early clinical assessment. And if you're not achieving that, then you should probably move on to something more aggressive with your monitoring. But I love what you said about slowing disease progression, Patrick, because that's key. I mean, we know that 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 disease still progresses from all the mitral clip data we have. And so why wouldn't you maybe even put that up front just to see? One of the other things is that we see echocardiographically, a lot of these folks still have mitral regurgitation later. And so you don't necessarily get the full story with that. We all see people with what's called severe MR at some point, but their wedge is you know, 10 or 12. And so obviously the echo doesn't tell you everything. And if you can get some PA monitoring with that, then maybe you can tell a little bit fuller story. Interesting. Let me, let me shift the, our thought just a second here. But before I do, James, do we have any questions from the audience? And I would encourage you to use the chat room and, and ask. This is a great opportunity to ask some of the people that that write the textbooks. So to be sure and, and, and put your questions. But James, do we have any questions? We do. We have chat online and was asking this. Are you using CRT and MEMS conjointly to help manage patients more efficiently or even turning a non-responder to a responder? We're prompting a combo with EP to change the LV pacing vectors. Anyone optimizing CRT based on PA yeah. pressures? So that's a, that's a great question. We actually have tried that. Um, not successfully yet that we've seen where we've changed the vectors 
um, in some of the patients, um, but certainly that has been looked into. And I think with the you know small number of folks that we've tried, I certainly can't say that it is it would not be successful. But certainly, I think if you have somebody that's not responding and you have you know multipolar vectors now, uh, it's certainly worth uh, earlier uh, change to potentially a different vector that might benefit the patient. Anyone else Phil, have experience? Nope. Phil, there's another question yeah. here to the three gentlemen, which is what kind of a system workflow do they have with CardioMEMS in terms of who reports the data, who manages the data, who makes the medication changes, and how do you keep from data overload? You know, it's an interesting question. So I can I can talk to that a little bit here. Uh, we've done a little over 300 implants. We have a pretty robust uh, monitoring program. Um, we have a nurse and an NP that uh, are responsible for our monitoring program. Um, there's a very good way of managing the data through uh, Merlin, um, and there's other vendors that are uh, coming on board, just as there are with um, devices such as Merge and Pacemate. Uh, that are going to start probably also enrolling uh, PA monitors. But you can limit that data with your thresholds and how you set up uh, your clinic. And usually we have our team watching twice a week. Um, and if anybody's out of their thresholds for more than two times, and we keep a little bit of a uh, uh, decent standard from about five millimeters um, above or below their threshold before we consider inter any intervention, um, you can certainly limit the data. Uh, we've done that. And and that APP that is responsible for our program still sees patients in the clinic uh, for three or four days a week as well. So it is certainly possible, um, and I, I think that's a large concern that uh, quite a few people have. Um, one of the things we do to uh, minimize uh, all the uh, data overload and, and constant looking is to have a tracking meeting weekly, uh, just in the same way that you know you have a transplant or a bad tracking meeting weekly. We do that for our remote monitoring as well. Uh, and that has certainly helped us not only grow, but also um, manage our growth. Yeah, I would. It's a very echo. important question. You have, or Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, because I'd, yeah, I'd love to hear would, from all of you about this question. I think it's seminal to, to get this. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's key. And, you know, I think back to my Houston days, you know, starting it off, uh, developing a larger car management program, then transitioned here to, Cleveland Clinic and the common denominators are to ensure you're minimizing the resources needed to respond. And so I think alert thresholds are key, doing the breakdown on the nurse or advanced practice provider needed based upon the volume. Uh, and we typically have a nurse navigator that, that part of her FTE, if you will, helps to oversee the part of program plus advanced practice providers that have it built into their tasking um, very similar to what was mentioned twice per week to um, um, make appropriate changes and, and assessments. And we've been very fortunate and really taken advantage of our colleagues from Abbott to have this embedded within our, our Epic to where um, we as staff, and this is what I love, this is running autonomously. Um, you know, we, we know when patients aren't responding, these non-responders, despite efforts made all on the front end, leveraging, leveraging expertise from our um, our colleagues, the nurse and advanced practice providers, um, to, to, to make it workable for even a large group, you know, here, here at Cleveland Clinic now at 1920 Heart Fire staff. And we just, we just d really in many ways def default to them. And, and, and it's fantastic when I want to review or mass to look in, it's, it's all embedded in Epic. It makes it very, very user friendly. Yeah, we, we have a very similar, um, I guess, probably hybridized between both of those concepts at St. Vincent. Um, what we've kind of done is we sort of have patients that are that belong to certain clinicians. And so we have nurses that we primarily work with. And so those nurses are the ones that are typically monitoring this for us. We use the alert thresholds as well. And we have phenomenal nurses who actually really enjoy having this data, I think, at least that's what they tell me, <laughs> um, to be able to help sort of know what's going on with the patient so we can make more informed decisions. And that's really, I think, cut down on maybe even some phone calls and maybe some of the other tasks. So you could sort of see how maybe you're rising with some data sort of dredge, if you will, but then you're dropping off and, and other things like phone calls that may take more time. So 
it's really been a time saver for us. The other thing that we've instituted is actually a one week post implant APP visit. So that way the APP can sort of see, okay, this is what things are looking like over that first week. Maybe the threshold wasn't set at the right exact place. And now we can sort of see that this person is doing physiologically well, but their PAD really should be more like less than 20 as opposed to less than 17. Otherwise we're going to get pinged every day. And so maybe that would help a little bit. And we kind of try to reevaluate those with every visit as well. Interesting. Bill, you want to take us into some physiology? <laughs> well, I am a physiologist. I can't help it. <laughs> my question, my question is, 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 you know, as we, we do the best we can, but of course this is a progressive disease. And I think many of the things we've talked about here, slow, or maybe even for super responders, reverse the progression of disease. But let's, let's, let's now go to a scenario that you've, implanted your class three patient who'd been hospitalized prior uh, with cardiomems mems and now and now you 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 see or you feel or you how do you know when they are moving <laughs> into a uh an advanced heart failure pathophysiology jerry why don't we start with you yeah it's a great um question and i think we're positioned better than ever before to understand that early progression. Uh, you know, and historically, as, as you know well, we would wait for these peaks and troughs related to reoccurring admissions. We'd want to define advanced heart failure by, by uh, worsening symptoms. That can be coupled with worsening kidney function, uh, and or liver function, blood pressure reduction, intolerance to meds. And the unfortunate reality, that in and of itself is associated with a lot of morbidity. Um, and so I like to um, see it as an opportunity to de detect advanced ambulatory heart, heart failure before this spectrum of shock associated with tissue hypoperfusion and end-organ or, end organ function. And so I think it's, in my mind, um, allows us to be much more simple in our construct or concept in that if patients are having worsening pulmonary diastolics or fiddling pressure and even though we may not have as um, robustly perhaps the stroke volume or low output component to high feeling pressure, worst possible syndrome, it is a red flag that merits earlier intervention. And I think the, the historical days of waiting for more overt disease, hopefully it will be behind us. And so and someone with the, that profile, oh, they, they, by, by, by definition, they had a hospitalization, they had high-grade symptoms, and the hemodynamics are persistent. If they're worsening, I think that's all you need to at least answer, to, to say this patient has an advanced heart failure profile. You know, I don't think we need to get into journal club about saying, oh, you know, do we need to pursue a formal evaluation for transplant bad? It just, it's, it's we're using a resource that allows us to, to detect a select group of patients that are failing, right? And, it, and, it, and it's not the patient failing, it's not the device failing, it's, it's the disease is progressing and that merits um, a uh, further exploration to understand the, the nuances of projected benefits and risks of end organ interventions, whether they're truly there, but at least it's a simple, clean red flag that we can hang our hat on. It's, it's way easier to remember. remember. Sorry, I was just going to say it's way easier to remember when a PAD goes up than it is to remember I need help, right? And these mnemonics that we've <laughs> talked about for years that we've unfortunately not really moved the needle on. You know, there's a great review article written by Dr. Morris and colleagues in uh, Circulation earlier this year that's phenomenal. I mean, it talks about when to re refer to an advanced heart failure center, et cetera. But unfortunately, it still makes it a little bit nebulous in certain categories. And that's one of the things that I think we've kind of failed at as a community, um, no pun intended, and, and sort of seeing that the PADs do go up. Maybe it is just something as simple as they went out and had a large salt-loaded meal, but maybe that shouldn't be normal for a person with an LV of eight centimeters and an EF of 10% happening every three days, right? And so these are the things that we can maybe really kind of move the needle on just to kind of keep it, as you said, keep it simple. But Patrick, what, what do you see as a fingerprint, sort of a hemodynamic fingerprint of, uh, of, of advanced progression? Yeah, uh, similar to what was mentioned previously, but I think one of the 
other things is how often that we're having to increase diuretics, right? You really, if somebody has a, a fairly stable disease or they've had good response to GDMT, oftentimes when we get them off diuretics or they stay at a nice stable dose and they're, they're smooth sailing, you know, even when they might have a little bit of a salt load. But uh, often what we'll see is that, you know, those PADs going up and then you're having to double diuretics or having to switch them to, you know, increased doses of BMX or torsamide or adding the thiazide diuretics. And when you, when you consistently see that, you know, that is that trend in addition to the elevated PAD that, uh, you know, as was mentioned by Jerry earlier, that's, it's, it's simple, right? You see that and you go, okay, we need to do something different here. We can't just keep relying on GDMT um, uh, for these patients. They're, they're going to need an advanced evaluation. Uh, and I think that's the, that's one of the biggest things that we've noticed is that additional need for increasing diuretics and you see it quicker, right? Uh, and so we don't have to wait for that end organ dysfunction. Uh, you, you can see it, you can understand what they're doing. You can even call the patients and say, hey, uh, you know, this is what we're seeing. And they can tell you, yeah, I had a large, you know, double pepperoni pizza. It was delicious. Okay, let's not do that anymore, maybe. Um, and if it continues to happen, you know that it's not just their salt loading. There is something changed in the trajectory of their disease, and they need uh, an alternate therapy than what's being provided. You know, Patrick, you, you hit on something that I, I, I'm going to ask the whole panel, and, and this is controversial, speculative, and all that stuff. So whatever the disclaimers. What has been your experience of linking what you see hemodynamically with what the patient tells you their level of symptoms are? Yeah, the uh, what, what you tend to see is, you know, oftentimes, and you know, to put it simply, people just start telling you that they have more bad days uh, when you start to see that PAD rise, right? Uh, when, when someone's going along well with their GDMT and, you know, stable disease, they might have a few bad days here or there. Uh, but mo more often, that's what we start to hear from patients. Yeah, I'm, I'm having more fatigue. I'm tired all the time, in addition to the swelling and shortness of breath. But they just say, listen, I'm having more bad days. And, and they start to notice, hey, you're calling me more frequently. We're making all these changes, but I'm not getting better. I don't feel like I'm getting better necessarily. Um, and, and oftentimes, that's a discussion that we that we have right before we say, okay, let's, uh, let's get you in the lab. Let's see the hemodynamics in terms of your cardiac output and, uh, and go from there. But more often uh, it's that, man, we're changing therapies and I still feel terrible. Mm. Ashwin, so Phil, I, have you ever I seen, have you ever, have you ever, oh, go ahead, Jerry, please. Oh, forgive me. I was going to say one thing that um, I think is super important is these, the trends, right? We know those patients that, you know, they, they have indiscretion with regard to the diet and it's up and down and you're monitoring these trends and we're now positioned to not have to wait for that worsening symptom. For me, you see persistently abnormal, let alone worsening, increasing pulmonary diastolic pressures. That's, that's such a, such a red flag. And, um, and, you know that's that's the real the real need. You know this cadence of follow up for symptom reassessment and or blood work. You know we to do that every week or two weeks. That's that's a resource that is almost impossible. I can be if I can mm -hmm. be quite frank. Mm -hmm. So I think that has to be highlighted. Uh, yeah, I, I I have to agree. I don't know Ashwin if you've ever played the game of guess the wedge prior to the to the right heart cath and try to figure it out oh. based on symptoms history. And <laughs> I quit playing um, <laughs> a, a long time ago, but uh, what, what are your thoughts about correlating symptoms with uh, what you find hemodynamically? Totally, yeah. I mean, uh, so, you know, the, that game is often played with our learners and uh, we're often both wrong, right? <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, the idea is, is really, you know, to try to help discern, um, as has been mentioned before about the disease progression, but also, is there more fatigue? Maybe that's the that's the other symptom that you're hearing. Um, and the, the bad days thing is a really great analogy for that. You may not hear the classic, you know, I have more PND or thopnia, or right heart failure, or right heart symptoms or signs, but those are the things you're trying to avoid. And so if you see not only those trends, but also got to mention, you know, not being able to have a pizza every few days, maybe kind of a bad quality of life. And why is it that that person's cardiorenal syndrome cannot handle that because it's very sick? Yeah. And so is that a sign that we should be maybe more aggressive with their interventions as well? Not to say that, you know, it's okay to eat Taco Bell after you get advanced therapies, but the point is that 
they, they should be able to handle that better. And so those are the things that I think would be also important to hear from the patient. I just can't really eat as much as I used to. And it's not cachexia necessarily, especially in Indiana. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so this has been phenomenal. I, you know, I, I'm just a surgeon. And, and so I rely on you guys to call me. What is it that your these new kind of guidelines that you've established in terms of detecting congestion, when the symptoms get worse, when the functional limitation is bad enough, and one we don't talk about too much, which is the risk of mortality from waiting longer. How do you put all that together and say, okay, you know what? I need you to see my surgeon buddy here. It, it's time to talk LVAD. So from all of this information that you get, how does that translate into that next step? Bob, I, I, yeah, think... I think. Go ahead. Sorry, Jerry, go ahead. So, uh, great question. And, you know, when we think back to the modeling we use to guide appropriateness for LVAD, whether it's an Intermax 4 patient with rest, breathlessness, and compromised functional capacity, or someone even sicker and weighing the, you know, projected benefits. Um, it can be very difficult with standard modeling to understand some of these patients where it's just fatigue, but they're not in the hospital. Maybe they have Intermax 5, 5 versus 4, so hard. I think I think the, the hemodynamic abnormal elevation coupled with someone with a prior hospitalization and a known remodeled heart, you have that benchmark remodeled heart, I think positions us to, to, to detect um, someone appropriate for, for bad therapy in the context of ambulatory, and let's just call it what it is, end-stage heart failure. You know, certainly, we, you know, many of us do the standards of six-minute walk test and understanding peak VO2 and, and you know, put it in, in, in context to, you know, appropriate uh, supported bad, you know, based on, uh, you know, CMS coverage of these type of things. But what's nice about the CardioMEMS in this, this worrisome patient population is, we don't have to wait for them to start falling off a cliff. I always see it as a sign of failure when your patient's coming in um, in you know Intermax two, right? And 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 they've been some patients to Phil's earlier question. Some patients downplay their symptom burden, and it's till the very end. It's the VT, and then it's the shock, and it's the renal liver failure, and then they become basal dilated. I think the cardiomems is, is giving us an opportunity to to better track these ambulatory advanced patients and at the bare minimum would merit a team a discussion on all right is this patient there in terms of bad listing for transplant and so it's the it's the same one on yeah. ashwin and then i want to hear from uh patrick as well yeah i totally agree and and you know one of the things that um we should talk about is hemodynamic non-responders right so right. if you're a hemodynamic non-responder based on the usual interventions, GDMT, CRT, now maybe mitriclep, those other things, then you should be considered for a VAD because we're going to have a 20-minute selection committee meeting about why your RV is maybe too sick for, for VAD or transplant, and now your, your liver and kidneys are too and that sort of thing. So can it basically help us really make that decision up front? And now all of a sudden, maybe we've got much better outcomes for our program as well, and patients are back to normal in terms of what they want to do quality of life wise. Good point. You know, I think, uh, I think, you know, to what was said earlier, the CardioMEMS gives us trends, right? So all the other testing that we've done in the past, you know, CPETs, looking at six minute walks, they're snapshots in time, right? And depending on how that person's doing that day or what their congestion may be, maybe they did a little bit better or worse, but the, the PA pressure gives us that trend. And while it's giving us that trend, it allows us to intervene at points along the way, whether that's with GDMT, upgrading the CRT, mitral clip, all the things that we could potentially do to slow that progression. But if we're not seeing that improvement, then we can have that conversation earlier. And we know just as what was mentioned, you know, you wait too long, now you're in biventricular failure and suddenly you're having much more difficulty with an LVAD or, you know, you're getting into a little bit of renal failure, a little bit of hepatic congestion and your, you know, post-operative times are gonna be much longer all the other potential complications that come along with it, as opposed to 
hey, we've seen this trend. We've been communicating with you routinely. We've been telling you along the way that if we continue to see this trend, we're probably going to need to consider those advanced therapies sooner rather than later because of you know all these other uh, reasons. And I think that allows the patient more time to understand what's happening, right? Because that's that's one of the bigger challenges when we talk to our patients and we tell them, hey, yeah, we're going to open up your chest and put this pump in there. And they think, oh my gosh, that's I, I don't know that I can do this. But if along the way you're having those discussions and they have an understanding of of what's going on and we don't see improvement, then they're ready for it. Um, and that makes for a much better uh, patient experience, I think, not only going into the operation, but afterwards as well. So Holly has a question that relates to this, what, what you just met, mentioned. She, she says, you know, how do you have this conversation with a patient that is scared of the LVAD? What are the things that you bring to the table, the evidence that helps them understand how critical this is at this point in their heart failure history? I think, you know, one of the things we start with, obviously, is just the, the risks and benefits, obviously, of continued medical management versus bad. And uh, we like to present that. But one of the best things we do for our patients is we have them meet with a bad patient, right, that was in their shoes mm -hmm. uh, before, that's had the bad, that's gone through it um, and can explain it to them. And what I always tell the patients is I can tell you all the science behind it. I can quote you the statistics. But it, the reality is I don't go home and plug it in at the end of the day. So you need to talk not only with us, but somebody who's had this experience and been through it, who's yeah. been on the other side of it and can see what it looks like on the other side of the hill. Yeah. And I think that makes the biggest impact for patients. Ashwin and Jerry, similar? Yeah, completely agree. And one of the things that is important to harp upon there, and Patrick mentioned this with the, with the cardio moms, is that you're not only watching their trajectory of illness and hopefully coaching them through that, but you're building trust along the way. And that would hopefully make it easier for you to talk about these really life-altering decisions with them when the time comes. Unfortunately, what often happens is, you know, nowadays we're meeting these folks, especially during this pandemic where click care has been delayed, et cetera, very late. And so we haven't even had a chance to have that conversation. But that probably behooves us to make it more of a conversation about PA monitoring up front, maybe even before we would have thought about it, still obviously as a class three patient, but you know, knowing that maybe patients may not get their care as time as they did in the past. Yeah. So, Ashwin, I would, I would agree. And really what we're highlighting here for the group is shared decision-making, right? Where it's above and beyond informed consent and benefits or risks. It's patients' values and preferences and add in the importance of the care provider or care giver. And whenever I meet a patient in clinic as opposed to in shock in the hospital, I always highlight it's a pleasure for me to meet you in the clinic to start to educate, highlight the anticipated trajectory. So the earlier, the the, the better. And I think that CardioMEMS monitoring positions us um, to, to do that, to ensure that we position ourselves to you to leverage and highlight contemporary bad data based upon reductions in outcomes. You know, when you look at Metamax, Roadmap, even data coming out of... Uh, um, uh, revive it, um, we know what patients' concerns are historically, and they may not match up and certainly have been improved upon related to stroke um, and, 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 and bleeding and rehospitalization burden in, in many ways. And so, you know, we all, but those of us, you know, committed to the bad space you know, aligned with DMV or Joint Commission, and we're given our, our education, our videos, hopefully a decision aid, right, two published, um, which we had the privilege to contribute to one of those significantly and so the earlier the better of you know and and so i think i think i think how we're defining this early detection of a sufficiently ill patient is is a key concept um yeah. is it, it it puts the patient front and center to not only know their trajectory be linked to this hemodynamic profiling which is uh, which in my mind is the gold standard to understand disease progression but it gives us the opportunity to intervene along these lines with communication yeah, before, before I turn this back to Phil, it is possible that CardioMEMS has helped you decide on the right timing for an advanced therapy such as the HeartMade 3 LVAD, and you proceed with the implant. But the CardioMEMS is still there in the patient. Is there information that you can gain from the CardioMEMS that helps you decide if you've achieved optimal decompression of the left ventricle 
with the LVAD to keep the patient out of class three heart failure. Is there something you've learned in your experience that helps here? And I'd like to hear from Jeff, but let's start with Ashwin. Yeah, absolutely. We absolutely use it 100%. And we actually just recently uh, published our experience in ASIO. Um, we've definitely reduced heart failure hospitalizations with that device still in place. And we've used it to hopefully reduce also bleeding events from right heart failure, for example, thrombotic events, uh, maybe from drying them out too much. And mm -hmm. in general, any other sort of, um, you know, stroke events or infection events even too would be something we're going to look at in the future. So we definitely use it. Why not if it's still there? And it can also help our VAD coordinators out too. I know we've got a lot of VAD coordinators watching in the, the audience. Hi to the St. B's VAD coordinators. We definitely um, use it a lot and hopefully it augments their care as well because it can kind of help them get more objective data as to why the patient may be sort of explaining what they're feeling in terms of symptoms. Interesting. Yeah, we, we've had a similar experience. Um, you know, we've, we've absolutely utilized it and we've had patients that have gone on from their MEMS implant to VADs, but we also, and some of our uh, VAD patients have implanted CardiMEMS postoperatively uh, as well to help with uh, volume management in some of our patients. But I think it goes back to the same uh, parts as we were talking about before. You know, once the LVAD's in, it doesn't mean you've gotten rid of heart failure, right? So we've still got to optimize their therapy. And that's a great way of looking at it to say, hey, are you know, they unloaded enough? Do they need more speed? Do they need uh, more RAS inhibition? Um, all the other uh, targets that we look at in terms of optimizing their therapy, um, you know, you still want to do that post-operatively for the VAD, and I think CardioMEMS is a nice adjunct for that. So, yeah, I agree, and and I've been a big believer in this for a long time, and we we've known um, that, you know, optimal LV and loading, you have to have something to look at to define it. You know, I remember I used to tell Bud Frazier back to Texas Heart, but, well, we're having heart failure related events on a NOVAD. He's like, how's that possible? We have a pump in, <laughs> you can, right? And, and I'm like, maybe we're not using the pump for what it is, right? And and, and it's the truth. And, and so you have to adjudicate for optimal LV unloading and minimize excessive LV unloading. And what better than a pulmonary uh, a pressure reading and pulmonary diastolic pressure to, to understand that. And, you know, many centers, uh, us included, are doing you know, right heart catheterization with some, some degree of um, cadence to minimize heart, the heart failure syndrome on an LVAD. And I think the cardiomem is going to be a game changer um, in this, mm -hmm. in this aspect. It, 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 you know, heart failure events are, remain significant contributors to remission post LVAD. And that's a real, and we all appreciate um, the heart failure in association with other events like bleeding, like was nicely mentioned. And so this all goes hand in hand and, and it, it gives us that, that key adjudicator that we're taking advantage of the LVAD and not going, you know, not being excessive in, in our management. So it helps tremendously. And then there's some last comment that have comorbidities that go on for bad, like COPD, lung disease, and these patients are bronchitis and fatigue. You're like, God, I, you know, you can't do an echo, acoustic windows are compromised. When their pulmonary stalk is, you know, 12 and they're on their LVAD and blood pressure is good, you're like, you know, I think you're doing pretty good. It, it gives you more reassurance. And we know that from CardioMEMS in general um, in this uh, patient population with comorbidities, and that holds true in the LVAT arena. Well, I'll tell you, this has been, a, as expected, a fantastic discussion. And I certainly thank you, all three of you, for your contributions. We're, believe it or not, getting close to the end of our hour together. Um, I, I want to just um, say a couple of points that I, I've heard today that I think are, are, are really important. One is, of course, timing is everything and, and, and certainly, you know, utilizing uh, insight into the lesion of the disease that drives the symptoms, that drives the outcomes, that drives the badness, as well as understanding how to make things better. Is, is, is essential uh, to utilize the innovations that we brought to the, to the doorstep here. But the other piece that I think Patrick said something that that really has resounded with me, and that is, uh, you know, we, we typically utilize point in time assessments of patients, and that's typically what we've had. I mean, we've been limited by our measurement tools, and now we we have the trend analysis, as Jerry mentioned very carefully. I, I you know, 
it, to me, we in cardiology tend to fire and forget, don't we? We tend to put the stent in and say, we fixed your coronary disease. We put the mitral clip and we fixed your mitral, we put the CRT divide, we fixed your left bundle branch. Well, we, 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 we take aspects of the pathophysiology and fix that aspect, hoping that that's going to take care of the entirety of the pathophysiology. Well, I think now I think we have the opportunity to see the entirety and and all of the components are important to fix absolutely uh but to have a a, a sort of a, a global view of how this process is happening allows us to avoid those horrible events of missing those that don't have no reserve that 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 on the surface look like they're doing really pretty well and yet they get atrial fibrillation and crash and burn and they're you know they go overnight to intermax too and and i think I think we now have the opportunity to move forward. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask each of our uh, each of our speakers to kind of sum up in your minds, timing, what we've learned today, what we've discussed, and let's start with Jerry. Yeah, you know I think historically in terms of ambulatory patients, focusing in on those that are ill, we've relied on you know, refractory symptoms to, de to define refractory heart failure. And I think we're positioned beautifully to, to monitor the hemodynamics that define the syndrome burden and even have more upfront information that these patients aren't going to do well. And I think it's an opportunity for us to incorporate it into our, into our heart failure platforms to monitor, detect, and react appropriately to an advanced heart failure patient based on their hemodynamics, namely their pulmonary pressure readings. And so I, I think that's fundamental to, to, to heart failure and uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to contribute today. Thank you, Jerry. Ashwin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would completely agree and, and echo the sentiments that you so elegantly put earlier as well as Jerry. And I would add that, you know, we've failed quite honestly at finding a way to identify these patients before they have a clinical event. So can we now find these patients before they have the event and even improve their outcomes from whatever advanced therapy options, or whatever their goals of care might be? And that's going to be the seminal, I think, potential um, goal we can kind of glean from, from all of this. Patrick, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. So I think, you know, I don't know that we've, we've failed, but we, we've learned, right? We've learned that we don't need to have patients prove to us that they have a significant disease. We know it's going to progress. And as we've learned that, I think we're realizing that there is a potential change in the cadence to how we treat our patients now. And we have the ability to actually see them while they're away from us and follow those trends appropriately, as we've uh, mentioned. And I think that changes uh, our ability to not only improve our understanding of the disease, but improve outcomes. Bob, why don't you take us home here? You're on mute. This, this has been an amazing conversation. And, you know, it gets back to the points of being able to recognize what in the past was less well-defined, and that is how you bring all this together, symptoms, congestion, functional limitations, and mortality. I go back to that all the time. But just how important hemodynamics are has never been stressed as well as I've heard it today. I think it's, it's so important. And, and I think if there's one thing that we can teach our community physicians that I know you all have great relationships with is recognizing that point. And I think you've done that really well today and laid it out nicely. And so I, I can't thank you all enough for, for taking the time to help clarify and demystify some of this process. You've made it really nicely interpretable. So I thank you all. And, and it's been a pleasure having you on this panel. And I hope our <clears throat> audience has enjoyed it as much as I have. Well, thank you, Bob. And thank you all for joining us, uh, especially thanks to our presenters, uh, our experts who are always so brilliant and fun to talk to. Um, James, why don't we turn it back over to you and we'll end our end our program. All right. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you, doctors, for all the information shared. I can tell you the audience was here from beginning 
to end, and it grew as we were going. So they were in uh, in tune with your conversation, and we know they appreciated that based on that metric. Folks, we do appreciate you taking time to join us. On behalf of Abbott, we do want to thank all of, of course, our panelists and you in attendance for joining. For the attendees, what I'm going to ask of you is one final action, and that's to please complete the survey at the conclusion of the program. Greatly appreciate your feedback. It gives us insights into these programs and how we can continue to structure them and the type of content to bring you in the future. So please fill that survey out. We will be looking at all of those as they come into us. With that, we will wrap things up. We wish everyone a happy and safe holiday season. Thank you all for being here. Be well, and we do look forward to talking to you all down the road. Thank <music> you.